Now come on, let's pray for him. Pray and anybody else that wants to pray after that, great. And then Caleb, after everybody's had a chance to pray, we need to pray. Father God, Lord, we just thank you for Ed, Lord. We thank you for his heart, for his passion and zeal for the Lord. God, I pray that uh, we, as men in this room, could even do what Ed does, Lord, and just have a fervor and a passion for you and our walk with you, Lord. God, I pray that, Lord, as he gets ready to speak and uh, preach, Lord, God, that you would just fill him. God, that you would uh, just, God, pour out the, the word on us today, Lord. God, we thank you for his ministry and his life, God. Lord, may we be impacted by the, the word that he's brought for us today, God. Uh, God, just continue to speak and, uh, and use him today, Lord. And, uh, God, uh, Lord, thank you for my friend, Ed. Thank you for his life. Thank you for his ministry, Lord. God, just uh, use him today. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 brother and uh, God, the, the word that you've laid on his heart today thank you Father in the name of Jesus I thank you that you hear our problems and cares this morning I pray that we will fill him with your spirit and <coughs> that you will empower him to declare your word and every word that comes from his mouth will be you Father and not this world and Lord we just pray that you would uh, give him peace and position with the clarity of speech help him to declare your truth boldly in the way we need to hear it, Lord, give us hearts to hear it in his name. God, thank you for Ed. Thank you for his encouragement and his boldness to proclaim your word. And I pray you just anoint him right now. Seigneur, je vais te prier pour que tu bénisses mon frère au moment où il va prêcher maintenant et que tu l'équipes et que tu le fortifies en toute chose pour que sa prédication soit puissante et nous encourage. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for Ed. Thank you for the light that he is in our classroom. And for some of us, the first time that we've gotten to know him, but just seeing his love for you yes. and the evidence of you in his life. We thank you for the opportunity um, to, that he has today to preach from your word. Lord, but I, I pray that he preaches truth, and I pray that his words are your words, and you turn our words to work in our lives. Yes. Let us be open to what he has to say, and let us hear the things that you want us to hear. Amen. <coughs> Amen. 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 Okay. Yeah. Low enough now? Yeah, it's good. It's good. <coughs> okay. Okay. All right, brother. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, also, we're going to give you some extra time if you need it. Okay. Right? If you land the plane early, that's fine as well. But I'm okay. Just you know, if you have a little extra. All right. All right. So we're, we're, we're so good on time, we'll give you a little bit extra. Okay. okay. Thank you, brother. Right. You ready to go? Yes, sir. Okay. Let me, let me get back here. Everybody get set, and I'll give you a nod, and you go ahead and begin. Okay. All right. <coughs> It's a privilege and an honor always to bring forth God's Word, the Bible. I want to take a few minutes to help you all understand my convictions and why I'm bringing forth this message today. All of us in here are called in the ministry in one form or another. All of us in here have been personally called by God 
to be a herald of his Bible, to be a herald of his message, and to be a herald of his good news. And what we have to understand is that the world is growing increasingly hostile to this book. The world is growing increasingly hostile to those who bear the name Christian, more closely to those who bear the name Evangelical Christian. And today, I want us to see why. And the main idea of my sermon is simply this. No matter what happens in our future, in the future of this country, in the future of the world, we are to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because that gospel is the very wisdom of God even though the world thinks it's foolishness. Let me put it this way. We are to preach the gospel no matter what happens in our life because the Bible tells us, as we will see in our text today, that the world views our message as foolishness. The Bible tells us that God, in his wisdom, has allowed the world to see our message as foolishness. With that said, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and the text of Scripture we will be looking at this morning is verses 18 through 25. Let me say that again. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And while you all are turning there, I want to give you this story to kind of get it in your minds where I'm going with this sermon and the points that I want to bring out that will undergird the main idea that I've already said to you twice. All right? The story is simply this. I was open there preaching at the Super Bowl in New York about two years ago. And for those of you that know anything about the North, you know that they are steeped in liberalism. They are steeped in relativity. They are steeped in, you just do what makes you happy, and I'll do what makes me happy. It's called utilitarianism. They are steeped in this idea of you do your thing, and I'll do mine, and let's just all get along. They hate the message that I'm proclaiming to you today, and they hate the very God who created them and gives them life. And when I was in New York, I saw this. There were people that were cussing at us. There were people that were getting mad at us for handing them tracts. There were people that were just so outraged that we would have the audacity to sit there and say that they are sinners in need of a Savior. Now, that said, why were they so upset? We're going to see that in our text today. If you look, I'm going to read the text and then we'll bow for prayer. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Let's read. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written... I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where's the wise man? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. But God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached, to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks, they search for wisdom. 
But we preach Christ crucified, the Jews a stumbling block and the Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Let's bow. <laughs> Most gracious Heavenly Father, I realize that I cannot do this without your help. I'm asking for you to help me. I, I want you and your glorious word to be the forefront of our minds. And, and I want us to be enraptured by the beauties of your word. And Father, I, I pray that this message would convict us all, namely me to be a better herald of your gospel and to take comfort. I pray that we would take comfort in the fact that you are in control. And I pray that we would take comfort in the fact that even though as we will see in our text that you've said to us that the world thinks our message foolish, that it is, it is exactly in your plan. And you will work all things out according to your glorious plan. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, before I get into the heart of my text, I want to take one more moment to simply explain to you guys the context of what has already happened in chapter 1. And the whole thrust of the entire book of Corinthians is Paul is writing to them and he is dealing with a church, with a group of believers. By the way, that is very important. Right from the outset in chapter 1, we see that Paul calls them at least three times the called of Christ. He addresses them, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is saying to them that I know you're believers. But the reason why, one of the main reasons why he is writing this message as he has noticed from a letter from Chloe, if you look down in verse 11, that there are quarrels among you. And those quarrels are the whole reason why the, the Apostle Paul is writing this letter. And he starts out in the main argument, starting in verse 18, saying and explaining and expounding upon the very wisdom of God. And that's what we're going to look at today. Paul starts out by saying, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. Now, that said, the, the author starts out by saying that this is the very word of the cross, that this is the word from God, that this is God's message. And he's saying that this message, that this gospel is absolute foolishness to whom? To those who are perishing. And that word foolishness in the original idea, in the original language, the idea there is simply this. That he is saying that for those who are perishing, for all unbelievers, he is saying that they view the message of the gospel, the word of the cross, the message of the cross as absolutely moronic. Have you ever had somebody call you a fool or call you a moron? If I were to use that in a congregation today primarily full of old people and I use the word moron, some of them may in fact take offense at that <laughs> because the word moron is considered a bad word but in the original language in the Koine Greek, the word that we get moron from is used here. And this is to connote and denote the weight, the gravity of what unbelievers think of our message. So what I want us to take away from this, from this verse is simply this. Whenever you open your mouth and tell people that they are sinners in need of a Savior and they cannot work their way to heaven, that no other religion in the world except for the religion of Christ will get them to heaven, 
if the Lord is not working on their heart, if the Lord is not opening up their heart, they will think you an idiot beyond your imagination. They will consider you foolish. They will consider you absolutely moronic because the message of the gospel goes against everything that they believe and everything that they hold dear. And in this verse, we also see that the people that view this as moronic, they are perishing. That's an ING word. That means that, that they are not only going to perish in the future, but right now, this very moment, those who have not believed upon Jesus Christ alone for their salvation, they are in the process right now of heading straight to hell. Dear friends, that should cause us to weep for the lost, that they are perishing, that they are not simply waiting and going to receive their judgment. Judgment is already upon them. Don't you remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ? What did he say? He said, for those who have not believed, they are condemned already. So the same idea in the Gospel of John is presented here for those that believe the cross of Christ is moronic, for those that believe that the cross of Christ is folly, as the, as the ESV puts it, they are already under the judgment of God, and they are perishing. In this verse, afterwards Paul says, he quotes Isaiah chapter 29, verse 14. In my NASB, it's written in all caps. And he quotes the prophet Isaiah who says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. And if you go back to Isaiah chapter 29, what you will find there is that the Lord is completely and utterly displeased with false worship. What you will find there is the Lord has become absolutely disgusted to the point of anger because these people thought that they were pulling a fast one on the Lord. On the Lord. And Paul quotes this verse in Isaiah chapter 29 verse 14 to say that no matter how wise those who think the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ are, the Lord's ultimately going to have the last word. He uses the language of destroying the wisdom of the wise. And brothers, that should set joy in our hearts that one day the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ will ultimately destroy all that is evil. And make no mistake about it, brethren, the wisdom of the world is evil. And God, in his goodness, he will destroy it the wisdom of the wise. Paul goes on to say, he asked what I take to be very sarcastic rhetorical questions. He says, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? See, here with these questions, Paul is driving the main point. Remember that first point that I said that God has made the wisdom of the world to be nothing. He is driving that home with these rhetorical questions. And as we near the end, I want to come back to these questions. So keep this verse, keep these questions in your mind as we keep moving forward. Paul goes on to say in verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, but God was well pleased to the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. I'd also take this to be sarcastic because he's using the very ideology of those who believe that the world, that those who believe that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is foolishness. And he's using their ideology, he's using their language to drive the point home that God, in his wisdom, ultimately knows best. He is saying here 
that God is well pleased at the foolishness of the message preached. Now, that language of well pleased, what sh should in our minds, what should that bring us back to? Should bring us back to the baptism account of our Lord. When, uh, when the Holy Spirit descended upon Christ as like a dove, what did God the Father say? He said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Did he not? He did. Now, why did Paul use that same language here? We're going to find out in a couple of verses, but also keep that in your mind as well. Then Paul goes back and he again explains, driving the point home, why in the wisdom of the world people cannot accept the offensive message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 22. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. You see, the Jews, they wanted miracles. That's the idea of the word there. They wanted their Messiah to come and bring miracles and usher in the political kingdom. And the Greeks saw it as foolishness, and they searched for wisdom because in their ideology, they did not understand how a God could come down in the mortal flesh of a man and die on a cross for us human beings. And the Bible goes on to say, but there's a contrast word here. And this hones in my second point. God has ordained that we should preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because the gospel in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is the very wisdom of God. That was a mouthful, so let me explain. Look at verse 24. <clears throat> or excuse me, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified. Now, I want you to skip over verse 23 and part of verse 24 and I want you to look at the second half of verse 24. So I'm going to read the first part of verse 23 and the back half of verse 24. But we preach Christ crucified. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, the back half of verse 23 and the first half of verse 24 is simply added information. He is going back again to explain why the word of the cross is foolishness. But if we take that part out, we see that Christ is the very power of God and the wisdom of God. Oh, my dear friends, how I would love for our Baptist churches to get a grasp on this, yes, even more than we do. Because the Bible says that Christ, in the great book of Colossians, that everything was made for him, by him, and through him. You see, dear friends, you and I, we live for Jesus Christ. So if our entire lives are not shaped by the gospel, if our ministries are not shaped by the gospel, dear friends, I want to be very blunt. You do not deserve to be here if your life is not shaped by the gospel of Christ, if you're not planning on having your ministries shaped by the gospel of Christ, I want you to know that you don't have a ministry. You have simple, vain foolishness based on the simple, stupid, moronic wisdom of this world. Dear friends, I cannot stress to you enough the importance that all of our ministries be based on, upon the person and the work of Christ and what he has done for us because he and he alone will be our only hope on judgment day as we stand before him because we will either be found naked in our sin and clothed with the moronic righteousness of the world or we will stand clothed in the very righteousness, wisdom, and power of God and that is the only way any man can get into heaven. And dear friends, I'm an evangelist. I have to do this. I don't know all your hearts. 
if any of you is realizing in this moment that you've never truly received the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, the Bible says if you will throw off the wisdom of the world and call upon the name of his Son alone, you will be saved. My friends, won't you come to Christ today? My friends, even if you're a Christian, won't you take this time to worship with me and reflect upon the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and be thankful for what he's done in your life, for saving you from your sin and for saving you from the wrath of God. You see, the main reason why Greeks search for wisdom and why Jews see it as a stumbling block is because their own foolishness is simply nothing more than arrogance and pride. It's the very same thing that got Satan kicked out of heaven. I take verse 25 as a wonderful topping off, a summary, if you will, of this little text. Paul says, because the foolishness of God, look at this, it's so beautiful. The foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. Now let me ask you, is Paul, say, is Paul saying that God is weak? No. Is he saying that God is foolish? That's blasphemy. Paul is again using the ideology and the wording of the world view of Jews and Greeks, of all those who are perishing, to drive home the point that God knows best. And he says here, the weakness of God and the foolishness of God is wiser and stronger than men. Remember the questions in verse 20 I ask you about? I want to say this. Where's the wise man? He's up in heaven seated, seated at the right hand of God. He is the wise man. He is the wisdom of God. Where is the scribe? My dear friends, no Jew in the world other than the Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, can make it to heaven. Where is the debater of this age? Debating will not get you anywhere. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Yes, he has. And that is through the wisdom and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to take very quickly just to summarize everything that I've said and drive it home so we can go home and worship our Lord today. All right? The Bible says that Christ, as I've already stated, has made all things for him and through him and by him. That's in Colossians 1. All right? So what we ought to do, since we are called into ministry, is go home and reflect upon the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask ourselves questions. Ask ourselves if we really believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You may find out that you may in fact do, but dear friends, if you do not, run to him and run to him alone. Because the day is coming where we will see the whole point of the world viewing the gospel as the foolishness in its fullest extent. Because our world is not going in a better direction. Our world is going in a worse direction. And some of you sitting in this room may have to die for your faith. The only thing that will get you through this is if Christ himself is the very wisdom and power of God. Let's pray. Most gracious Father, I pray and I ask that you would rivet home in our minds everything that I've talked about. And Father, I pray that if there's any sin in our lives and any repentance that needs to be done, that we would do that because you are worthy of repentance even if we don't get anything from it. And Father, I thank you for those that have come to 
hear me and for everybody in the class. And I just pray that I could have been a blessing upon them today. And it's in your son's name that I pray. Amen.